Good morning. Welcome to Red Hat Summit. Um, I was actually really psyched uh, to see all those demos go off this morning. I've been involved with them over the last uh, while, and it's great when you see the technology come together and actually work on stage even. Um, so I thought I'd start today uh, by sharing with you a bit of a rant, uh, one of my pet peeves of modern civilization, at least as it applies in the US, and that's the whole idea of flavors, right? You got flavors of ice cream, okay, that's fine, but now we've got flavors of Oreo cookies, we've got flavors of Triscuits, uh, flavors of M&Ms. But what really gets to me is hummus, right? Hummus is an ancient food, right? It's traced back to Babylonian times. And, you know, I'm sure it's varied over time, uh, but at any given time, in any given place, hummus was probably pretty much hummus. You know, my grandmother's recipe may have been different from your grandmother's recipe, but it was probably recognizable the same thing, as the same thing. So we, we, we bring it here, and what do we do? Now we've got 29, 30 different flavors of, of hummus. You walk into a supermarket and there's a, a refrigerator, you know, one of those open fridge things that's like full of choices, right? And yeah, choice is a good thing. Some of these things are actually kind of yummy. I, arguably they're not hummus, but they're, they're, they're yummy dips. Uh, but of course it can be overwhelming, right? And, and that is one of my pet peeves. I go over it with my kids all the time and they tease me about it. But the, the, the <clears throat> way that this actually applies in our world and kind of the, non-food world, if you will, um, is we're confronted today with a, a number of choices across a number of different dimensions, right? Take languages and frameworks. Time was, you know, you were either a Java shop or a .NET shop. If you were a Java shop, you were an EE shop or a Spring shop, and of course you looked down at the other guys. Looked down on the other guys. Now, of course, we've got, you know, Node taking off. We have Python, you know, being adopted very widely in you know, AI and ML, um, uh, workloads. Each of these has a bunch of frameworks associated with them, and you've got to, of course, you know, pick the ones that you're interested in and pick the ones that are, you know, decide among them, right? And then, you know, on the client side, we've got Angular and React and all, and all of these different, different options, and, you know, you try to get them to work together. And then, you know, even back in Java land, we've got really cool reactive uh, things like, like Vertex. Um, we have Scala, we have Akka, we have all these choices. And, of course, it's not just languages and frameworks. We're going to talk a lot more about this, but we're in the midst of a pretty significant architectural evolution, as we've all been reading about for the last, uh, last few years. And there's actually good reasons for having a lot of these choices, um, and that's because we're, we're really trying to you know, deal with the, the, the difficulty and complexity of you know, developing, deploying, and running software um, systems in, in production. Um, but there's actually another dimension as well, and I don't have a good name for this. I was trying to think about it. I, I, I haven't come up with anything good, but th think about I, classes of problems or classes of, of, of solution. These are kind of cross-cutting things, right? You think about AI, right? You know, AI is applicable and you know, diff you know, kind of independent of language. Um, uh, things like distributed ledger, streams, rules. You know, uh, Jim mentioned uh, optimization an optimization problem in the OptiPlanner uh, project this, this morning. So there's all these cross-cutting concerns, and again, there, there's a bunch of choices, a bunch of things <clears throat> that I need to be um, aware of. So the question is, how can you make sense out of these things, and, and how can you have a, kind of a framework to think about and what are some reasonable questions to ask? So the way I think about it is that there's really kind of four things at play, right? At bottom, there's a bunch of fundamental questions and concerns related to how you build test, deploy, and, and run software. And those, those questions and concerns don't change, right? What changes is how we answer them and the trade-offs that we make and, and the weights that we give to each of these concerns. And we'll talk more about these, but you know, things like how do you value developer productivity on a more mundane scale? How do you do test and debug? And how do you do builds and those kinds of things? Now, those things are all affected by three other things that change, right? That, you know, obviously, changes in technology. Uh, you know, containers come along, they allow us to solve a bunch of problems in a different way, but introduce you know, a new set of, uh, maybe a new set of problems, but it'll make us solve these standard problems in, di you know, in different ways, and we'll talk more about that. Um, there's changes in market imperatives, right? And those, you know, uh, again, we'll talk more about this, but you know, we're in, in the sort of need for speed uh, stage of, of the world right now, and that's driving a lot of technological choices, and it's also driving a lot of a lot of uh, the trade-offs. And, and lastly, <clears throat> and just as importantly, though, is you know uh, cultural and process changes that are, are at disposal that kind of interplay with all of these and, and allow us uh, to, to make um, you know different different set of trade-offs. So 
what are these things that I'm talking about? Um, probably not a complete list, uh, but I kind of break them up into kind of bigger picture issues and um, kind of more mundane or more prosaic, but equally um, important. So things like, you know, how do we make developers more productive, right? And how do we balance productivity with the need for, you know, compliance and governance? So I've, I've worked in a lot of startups where, you know, speed is of essence and neatness counts, but, you know, not so much initially. And I've also worked in much larger, more staid companies, not for very long, where um, developer productivity just doesn't matter, right? And so it's all about compliance. It's all about, you know, making sure everything is fully traceable, right? And then other things like software, you know, how do we make it, software delivery more predictable, more timely, and so on. Interestingly, how do we prioritize usability and accessibility of software? Uh, you know, back when we had, when software was, you know, kind of a, 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 an internal concern, right? It was what you used to run the business, and we could afford to hire more people and take more time, then we would trade off feature function for usability, right? And so we could train our way around glitches in usability and focus effort on feature function. An interesting story on this one is my wife is a cardiologist, and uh, the uh, EMR technology that they use in her office is, you know, the UI is something out of the early 80s. I mean, it was, it was, it's really, really awful. And, you know, in thinking about this, and I, I think what, what, what happened was this stuff was, was developed at a time when paid doctors were seeing maybe 10 patients a day, right? And they had more support staff, and, you know, there was, there was just a lot more stuff around it. Now everybody's running leaner and meaner. My wife sees 18 to 20 patients a day plus, and this is, you know, she's a cardiologist, so these aren't like, you know, well baby visits, right? These are complicated patients plus follow-up plus all these other things. And so she ends up spending, you know, three, four hours every night when she gets home from work finishing all her charts, okay? Um, you know, we're, we're and, and, and that's compounded by the fact also that she's got a phone and she's got an iPad, so she knows what usability looks like, right? So there's some even bigger picker, picture questions um, that we've asked for a time, and that is, do we even care, right? Why don't we just outsource it and focus on what our business is really about? And that was, you know, a question where we made a choice for a time, but what we're seeing in our, in our customers uh, is that that choice is being rapidly reversed, uh, and software development is being brought back in-house as an area of expertise. You know, and obviously, you know, cost constraints and all those kinds of things, but, <coughs> um, you know, we're, we're really moving back into software being an internal thing. So on the sort of more prosaic, but arguably very critical uh, questions, at least for developers, you know, it's these, right? How do we trace, debug, and, and monitor, right? We always have to do those things, right? How do we build and deploy? How do we test? Can we afford, you know, there was a time when, you know, automation was, yeah, a nice thing, but you could still, you know, do manual testing. You know, that, that's not really feasible, right? How do we deal with load balancing, fault tolerance, resilience? Um, you know, I'll just talk about these in, in more detail, but consider um, scale-up versus scale-out architectures, right? Um, you know, at some point we had cheaper hardware and memory, so scale-up made, made a lot of sense. Um, then containers come along, uh, and the web scale requirements, and now we, we have, we, we scale-out architectures make, a, make, make more sense, and so we're, we're making a different set of trade-offs. So <clears throat> one of my points here is that the, uh, the, one way to look at the history of, of enterprise computing is as is, is this is this continuous though forward moving cycle, kind of a helix or a slinky like this, right? Where you know we're, we're we are in fact moving forward and we'll talk more about that, but but you know we, we reach back in time and find old solutions, seemingly old solutions, to actually address new classes of problems. And sometimes we have new classes of problems for which we need new solutions, and we'll talk about um, those as well. So. I do want to pause for a minute uh, and uh, kind, of, kind of acknowledge the fact that we actually have made progress um, as an industry. You know, going back to, you know, not January 1st, 1970 as time zero, but just consider Netscape's IPO in 1995 as a time zero, right? Open source was already a thing. Red Hat was two years old at the time. Uh, but the degree to which you could, in effect, uh, you know, assemble or compose an application building on top of, you know, existing components was by today's standard really quite primitive, right? Um, you know, there were certainly libraries that, that you could buy, and there was some, you know, there were open source, the open source things available, but definitely not the degree to which they are today. And pretty much everywhere I worked at the time, we rolled our own, right? You go someplace, they have their own hash tables, their own trees, their own this, that, or the other. Um, and this is where, you know, I get to 
do another mini old guy rant, and, and that is that you know, one of my favorite um, interview questions when I'm phone screening people is um, to ask them to describe how a hash table works. And I'm just shocked. I'm shocked by the number of people with advanced degrees from good schools who simply cannot explain to me how an insert and a lookup works in a hash table, because a lot of them simply don't have to. Actually, at one point, I flamed uh, the, the head of the computer science department at WPI because he was my TA as an undergrad, and I said, you know, Mike, what's going on? And he's like, well, they don't have to know this stuff, and so we're trying to teach them other stuff. Um, but it goes beyond not having to write your own uh, hash table, right? Um, developers, as developers today, we have at our disposal not only you know libraries and utilities, but you know services. You know we can go to Amazon and get queues. We can uh, uh, do social logins and all these kinds of things, right? And so we really are, I think, making progress to the uh, notion of kind of standing on the shoulders of giants rather than stepping on each other's toes. To quote Richard Hamming's uh, '68 Turing Award lecture. But let's go back to 1995. Um, on the process side, uh, Kent Beck, who's the author of Extreme Programming, explained uh, kind of the origins of you know, Agile, right? Uh, wouldn't become the leader of the Chrysler C3 project where he kind of worked on this, t this technique until 1996, and the book wouldn't get published until 1999. Now, of course, there were those of us who were doing test-first development and you know, rapid iterations, but it was definitely not in the gestalt of the, the, the industry. Um, also on the process side, Grady Booch is actually credited with coining the term continuous integration in 94, but not in the same sense that we mean it today, right? Cruise, Cruise Control was actually released in 2001. And this is another little uh, trip down memory lane. I remember when a couple of developers who were um, working for me in a startup I was in at the time brought Cruise Control in-house, set it up, and I'm glad to say I kept my mouth shut, uh, but my thought was, well, why the heck would you want to do a, a build on every commit? You know, and, and we all have our Luddite moments, and you know it passed. Um, but you know, it's probably a bit of hyperbole, but my observation is that when I, when I look at how uh, development teams work today, I would say that teams that are, say, in the 30th percentile in terms of uh, development process rigor today are probably more rigorous than teams in the 70th or 80th percentile were you know, a quarter century ago. So we should pause and acknowledge that. Um, so another time zero moment, and it's probably cliche uh, to bring this up, is of course, the release of the iPhone in 2007, right? Um, I'll do it anyway, uh, and again, I, I remember kind of audibly gasping when I first saw Pinch to Zoom on Google Maps and everybody in the room laughed at me, but it was, it was you know, one of those moments for me. Um, of course, you know, digital transformation or digitization, whatever you're gonna call it, was already um, a thing, was already underway, but there's no question that the ubiquity of uh, you know, mobile devices and you know, connected devices and so on <coughs> uh, has, has really flipped software from being a you know, this, this sort of back office concern that you use to run the business to being really front and center, right? So, you know, we think of Daimler as building cars, uh, but in the words of their CEO back in 2015, he described Daimler as a network mobility provider. Um, another example I heard of recently was Red Bull, uh, the, you know, the, the hip drink maker. They actually s sponsor hackathons. Um, and part of the reason is that um, they own uh, broadcast rights, they have a lot of digital media, they want to be able to do proper attribution and pay royalties and whatnot. So they uh, recently sponsored a hackathon around blockchain to figure out how they could use that technology to, uh, to do this. So what we've seen you know, since that time, and as a result of this, is acceleration, right? So the overriding uh, market imperatives of the thing, you know, the, those three things that, that change, the overriding market imperatives today, to my mind, are speed, efficiency, and agility on the delivery side, and ease of, ease of use and on the adoption side. You know, security is understood, understood in this, my world, my view to be a given, although as we all know, you know we have as an industry a ways to go there. Um, and according to some IDC uh, predictions that I've seen, um, you know, this isn't slowing down, right? The number of, they're predicting that the number of new applications that, gonna, that are going to have to be written in the next five years, it's gonna be, is gonna be equal roughly to uh, the number of applications that have been written in the last 30. Right. So things aren't really changing there. So let me give you a, a simple kind of hand wavy example um, of the kinds of things that I'm talking about uh, in terms of you know, new trade-offs uh, driving new solutions. Right. So you know, again, it's a truism to say that the imperatives of you know, efficiency, agility, and speed uh, kind of run counter to you know, traditional monolithic and tier applications, uh, architectures rather, with you know, uh, waterfall. 
uh, development methodologies, right? We have complex code, dependency, uh, hell, and all, the, all that goodness, right? So we decouple independent dom uh, domains, assuming we do it right. We now give developers and development teams the flexibility and agility that they need to move uh, very quickly. But we still have to debug and monitor and trace and all these things, right? We, we, we don't do things perfectly. Uh, and in fact, by making the application more distributed, we've made these problems more difficult. You know, in a traditional app, you, your backend logic was probably running in one process. You could attach a debugger to it, look at the logs, you know, go to town, right? In a, in a distributed system, uh, you know, you still have to do all these things, but now we bring different and you know, newer technologies to bear. So we're looking at things like Jaeger for tracing and the FK stack for log aggregation, because I've got to bring all these logs together to make uh, sense of them, and um, uh, Prometheus for metrics, and then platforms like OpenShift really to pull all these things together. At the end of the day, you can still attach a debugger, right? But you gotta figure out what pod you're gonna attach it to. <clears throat> so again, this is admittedly one hand wavy example. Um, but let's, let's look at some where, where, where you know, new trade-offs kind of um, bring back some, some old goodies, right? You know, old ideas get a new life. Let's look at, from again, I'm looking at things from a developer productivity um, point of view or from a developer's point of view. Let's look at you know, dynamic linking, you know, move, the move that we made to JVM, CLR, you know, these abstractions over the OS, <clears throat> and then uh, scale up architectures. So whether we're talking native libraries or jars or DLLs, right, dynamic linking was obviously a good thing, right, for, you know, you can, you have to rebuild your application, you can, you can, you know, share common components, you can update them independently. So this is all goodness. Um, but of course there were downsides, right? You have shared dependencies, so now you have dependency hell. Uh, so you have to, you know, do either coordinate things or, or kind of jump through hoops to isolate uh, different, uh, different components. But given the technologies that were available at the time, the market imperatives and the processes at our disposal, it was a reasonable set of trade-offs and it kind of answered for a while. Now, I do want to make one point here, which is we still had to test, right? We didn't have to rebuild out anything. We didn't have to rebuild the application, but we still had to test to validate that, that changes weren't going to break things. So on the coding side, um, uh, during the 90s, I, I was a C++ developer, and I experienced the, the, the pain and the joy of writing you know, portable code across any number of you know, operating systems, compilers, and um, all that good stuff. And worse, the fun of debugging things on you know, platforms like AIX that, as far as I'm concerned, were designed to punish us for anything that we'd ever done or would ever do again. Um, so by comparison, Java was a joy, right? You write to the JVM, Bob's your uncle, right? You have, of course, you have to test everywhere, but you know, realistically, you can actually think of the, you know, if I count the number of OS-specific things that I've encountered in, in Java land, it's probably, I can count them on my fingers and toes. Um, and of course, um, you know, with memory and disk being cheaper, we could scale up to bigger machines. We didn't have to worry about startup time. That got amortized. Uh, so market imperatives change, right? It's all about speed and agility, as we said. On the technology front, containers come along and microservices and now functions, right? So these are in support of the speed and agility in, uh, imperatives. And on the process side, of course, you know, agile DevOps and all that good stuff. So now what happens though is the overhead of the JVM isn't amortized across my entire application or across you know, a number of applications that's bound to one service, okay? So I care about, uh, I care about that. Uh, Kubernetes pods are ephemeral. Right, and functions are even more so. So startup time matters. All this stuff that I never had to think about for years. Um, so of course we've you know made some significant advances in OpenJDK, and you can write some pretty tight uh, you know JVM based uh, containers. But it's still it's a the point is it's a first order consideration. You have to think about these things. Um, and of course, you know with scale out architectures, I care about my image size because I worry about density. So I'm also building container images, so now I actually, in some sense, have to care about the OS because I'm packaging up some of the, the, the user space with my container, and it really matters if I'm running RHEL or Ubuntu if I want to run it in production and have Red Hat support me. So, and if you think about it, containers, you know, this is kind of where the old is new again. Containers are statically linked executables on steroids, right? Even more so, because now you're dragging operating system along with you, right? So you have benefits and you have some of the costs, right? And it's actually not just a change for developers, obviously, on the off side, right? And now if I'm gonna, I can't just patch my servers if I have a CVE or you know, another upgrade, I've gotta start rebuilding containers. 
So I had a, um, during a customer briefing recently, a customer brought up a reasonable question and said, geez, you know, having to do all this is, is kind of expensive. You know, is this the best way? Is rebuilding containers the best thing that we, that we can do? And the short answer was, well, yeah, that's the whole point. Containers are immutable. The whole point is to rebuild them. But what we have at our disposal now are CI CD systems and processes that actually support us in doing this, which is something that you know, was nascent uh, uh, in prior times at best. Um, right, so the other thing is we've kind of solved dependency hell, right? This is great. Now we have, we're building everything into our container. I can you know, release whenever I want. Now the question arises, okay, how many different versions of any given dependency do I have actually running in production? Uh, and you know, how am I gonna track that and, and, and take care of it? Now, part of the whole DevOps model is that the, you know, the, the two-pizza team owns it and it's, and it's their problem, but it's nevertheless a concern, right? It's something that we do have to, to think about. Um, an interesting observation here is, you know, look at a new technologies that come along that kind of take the best of the old and new world uh, and, and are, are really applicable and, and relevant to how we work today. I'm thinking of Golang. And I know it's not you know, seeing wide adoption in the enterprise, but what's yet, uh, but what's, what, what's interesting to me is we're back to you know, running native code. We're building statically linked executables. Um, they you know, build very tight, they have quick startup times, all that, all that good stuff. Cross compiling is built into the kind of the way you do things. Um, but we have their garbage collected, and they have really, really cool primitives for uh, Go, Golang is garbage collected, and has really cool primitives for, you know, um, writing concurrent code and all those things. So they kind of, you know, looked at looked looked in, at the at the old and brought in stuff from the new. So there's another, um, and to come back to application architectures, but. I'd like to talk about another example of kind of the cyclical nature of our industry. And, and Paul touched on it in his keynote this morning. I was glad he didn't completely steal my, everything I was gonna say. Um, you know, it's his prerogative, I guess he talks first. Um, but you know, there was a time, as he pointed out, that the, the industry was kind of dominated by vertically integrated hardware and software stacks, right? The, you know, the HPs, IBMs, you know, DeX, and uh, Sun, and so on, right? Then you know, between Intel and Linux and, and Windows, we kind of had a sort of a, a breaking up of that model and a, more of a, a democrat, democratization, de demo, whatever the word is. Um, but it seems now, if you think about it, that we're back in the land of fully integrated hardware and software stacks, right? And I'm talking about the, the big cloud vendors, right? Now, it's not exactly the same thing because you, know, you can take RHEL, you can run it anywhere. But if you, if you start adopting you know, AWS-specific services, uh, and, and really build your application to one of these clouds, you're, you're just as bound as you were if you were building it na something natively for AIX. So, but as you saw in, the keynote, in our keynote this morning, as I'm seeing with every single customer I talk to, right, chances are you're gonna be dealing with multiple clouds running across multiple footprints, multiple locations. Um, so, Practically speaking, then, what, is, what does hybrid cloud mean in this context? And I, I'm bringing it from a developer's perspective, okay? Uh, one way to think about it is by, by what it isn't, right? If, if I have to go back to thinking about, you know, what, uh, what platform I'm gonna deploy and test and run on and how I'm gonna deploy it based on the platform, and I have to start building my own, you know, abstraction libraries like we did back in the C++ days where you had your, your portability libraries and you linked in the, vari the various things, right? I may be living in a multi-cloud world, but I'm not living in a hybrid cloud world, right? On the other hand, if I can take the exact same bits, run dev test in one, on one footprint, production somewhere else, um, if, as we saw this morning, I can take the same bits, run them across multiple clouds, either for you know, load balancing, you know, either kind of fully load balancing uh, across them as our uh, fellow from Amadeus uh, talked about, or, or in a bursty way, <clears throat> you know, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about hybrid cloud, right? It's not always going to be perfect, but the idea is to move to that, to, to, to consider all these things and move to a, a model where you're, you're really abstracting away, not just, you know, be, uh, the, that the, the, the platform layer, but really above that as well. Now, here's, here's the, the wrinkle in all of this. 
you know, as developers, we've seen self-service and there's no going back, right? Uh, you know, we can, uh, the, the, our, our, our time to value is, is really our goal. And if we can go to Amazon or Azure or whatever and spin up the services that we need to get our application into production, we'd be silly not to. And, and, and there's, there's, you know, there's a, a short-term benefit and a long-term cost, but that, that's a, um, a trade-off, right? So what this means is that on the private cloud side, we're actually, you know, somebody who's running a private cloud is in, in some sense competing with these hyperscale vendors uh, for the attention of their developers. Now, of course, they can, they can mandate it, but at the end of the day, the, the business is gonna win and they're gonna go and you know, squirt out and do something that they, that they need to do. So, um, you know, it's important to have a common set of services that have not only consistent API, but consistent behavior across uh, your public cloud. And there's, you know, the kinds of things I'm talking about in this case are sort of developer level things, you know, messaging databases, those kinds of things. Um, they have to be easily consumable. Um, they have to be kind of measurable so we can do chargeback and whatnot. And uh, importantly, they have to be efficiently, efficient to operate uh, so that you know, the, the, whoever's running their private cloud can, can in fact do so uh, in a cost-effective way. So that ties into our strategy here at Red Hat, right? Is, is part of, in addition to OpenShift, where we, the goal is to have a consistent set of services in, in the service catalog that spans the hybrid cloud, in, but also includes, you know, uh, you know, services from AWS or Azure if those are appropriate. The, the point is, you know, going back to my choice rant, choice is a reasonable thing. It's good to have choices, but you need to have some context and understand and kind of make those decisions with your eyes open, right? So if you're going to lock yourself in, that may be the right short-term or forever business decision, but at least you should have some options there. So getting back to architecture for a bit, um, I do have the good fortune of speaking with a lot of Red Hat customers I've indicated uh, at briefing sessions in Boston and, and whatnot. Um, and it's pretty universal. Uh, everybody we talk to has, has or is about to have a, you know, modern application initiatives or DevOps initiatives, you know, by whatever they're, they're, they call them, um, they're, they're moving in this direction, but of course they, everybody has existing applications and those aren't going away. Um, I've seen some uh, IDC data uh, that, should, that, that says that about 20% of applications in production today are actually you know, microservices or MSA architecture, which actually, if you think about it, seems kind of high. Um, but, it's still also, but, but it also indicates that we have a long way to go. Um, and look, here's the other thing. You know, in the, the arrows kind of imply that you know, there's goodness to the right. Um, and yeah, in some sense, maybe there is, but you know, in some sense, a smallish, you know, MVC monolith or a mini lith or a micro lith might be the thing that you need. You know, you, you, you can get the ball rolling, you can refactor from there, right? So this isn't a, you know, a, a religious thing. You have to make pragmatic choices. Um, you know, it's also the case that, you know, existing applications uh, can be containerized, you know, expose some of their IP as restful services and, uh, you know, either as a starting point or, or you know, for a long time, you know, participate uh, in a kind of a, a hybrid architecture, if you will. Um, in fact, uh, one of our customers, KeyBank, spoke about, spoke about a case like this in one of the summit keynotes last year. But, you know, having said all that, we're obviously at the point where we're composing applications, as I indicated earlier, from existing large blocks, you know, using smaller bits of things to glue together is, is really, uh, has in fact taken hold. So, a few considerations, like, you know, there's, there's an infinite number of them. There's, you know, blog, many blogs written and many more to be written. Uh, but, you know, it's all, like I said, it's all well and good to bring existing IP forward uh, without having to rewrite everything. Um, but if you think about, just think about performance alone, right? A lot of times the, the, the performance envelope and the kind of scale requirements of existing applications simply aren't gonna work in a, in a more modern architecture with more modern requirements. Um, in my own background, um, before coming to Red Hat, I worked at a company where we had um, actually a desktop application that did some pretty intense computation, uh, really some really cool stuff, you know, hundreds of person years of IP and all this, this goodness. And of course, we were challenged by our board to kind of bring it into the modern world. Um, 
the thing is, there is just no way we're going to rewrite, rewrite this stuff, right? Um, and it, it's just inherently compute intensive. So in thinking about, okay, well, how do we deal with this? We actually kind of went back to the drawing board in designing the, the new application and sort of kind of built asynchrony kind of into it from, from the get-go, so we, we, you know, we, we had to essentially adapt the application that we were building to, to uh, take advantage, to, to be able to take advantage of the technology that we had. We had to make it possible, for example, to you know, continue to make edits and you know, change your inputs and, and you know, lob off jobs, but, we, but whereas in the, in the desktop application, uh, even though sometimes you had to go get a cup of coffee to have a computation done, you know, the model was it was kind of interactive. Right here we said, no, 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 it's not. You know, the, these, these, running these models is, in fact, a, uh, a background process. You know, in a less extreme case, um, consider interactions between serverless, you know, function, you know, functions and microservices, right? The, the whole serverless model is that, you know, these things can, can, are super elastic. They can scale really fast, and there's all kinds of cool stuff that, that uh, uh, any, you know, any serverless system is going to do about, you know, caching, you know, containers and all those kinds of things, so you can spin them up and down. Suppose you have one of these things that's invoking a microservice that's even that's auto scaling running on OpenShift, right? The, the speed with which Kubernetes can spin up and down containers is simply not gonna match the speed to which a serverless system can scale up and down. So you actually, can, that's something you have to think about and test and make sure that you, you have ways of dealing with that, what I would call impedance mismatch. So I've talked about this, it's, I guess it's, you can tell I've, I've been a programmer for a long time because I always think about the, the testing and debugging kinds of things, right? Um, but <laughs> that's the reality, we have to do this, right? So we'd wanna be able to, you know, in a hybrid world, we wanna be able to, you know, monitor and trace kind of into, you know, uh, some of our legacy stuff, but at least we should be able to, uh, you know, s visualize and measure the interactions between kind of, you know, older and, and, and newer components. Um, and then, one final point here is, you know, if you're, suppose you're running across the, hi, the, the hybrid cloud, you assume you are, um, you kind of have to think about how these, these uh, you know, older applications, are they in fact portable? Yeah, you can certainly containerize and, you know, and may perhaps run them elsewhere, but you may have either technical reasons or, or um, you know, compliance reasons or whatnot where that's not possible, and so you have to start thinking about, okay, what are you gonna do? How do you deal with you know, that potential latency, how do you deal with, uh, you know, maybe data replication. Um, so those are kind of th three concerns. The point is, you know, the, the, these are all things that are all doable, but they're, you know, they don't uh, necessarily come for free. They do, uh, they, they do, you know, one point to make here, though, is that having a common platform like OpenShift across, you know, all of your footprints is, I would say, kind of a necessary condition to be able to actually make progress here. Um, and as a further example, here. Uh, so actually illustrated to look at the evolution of microservices technologies over the last several years, right? Um, I think we've come a long way from Netflix OSS being on the cutting edge of microservices technology. Um, you know, a lot of the capabilities, um, with a lot of the capabilities and, 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 and uh, technologies kind of being subsumed either into the platform or running as uh, su uh, support services, right? So if you think about, you know, kind of back in 2014, Netflix OSS land, you know, the, we made a trade-off to go to micro, you know, microservices, so you got a certain amount of, you know, uh, flexibility and, you know, developer productivity and so on, but uh, there's a lot of stuff that actually impinged upon your code. You actually have to, you know, deal with things like client-side load balancing, you know, registering your service circuit breakers and so on. Um, you know, fast, fast forward a little bit to, to where we are today, and a lot of these things, as I said, have kind of sedimented down into, into, the, into the platform, right? So, Kubernetes has um, uh, discovery, you know, built in. Server-side load balancing, at least, is, is, is built in. Now, there are, and, and the other pieces, these various support services now are running within Kubernetes itself, so now they're kind of part of the same fabric, right? Uh, there's still pieces that, that, that remain, you know, so if you want to do client-side balancing or circuit breakers and, uh, and so on. So, we're actually really excited about uh, Istio, uh, and, and service mesh architectures in general, but Istio in particular. Um, and there are some uh, really good talks at Summit that I would encourage you to attend for kind of a more of a, you know, a serious deep dive uh, into it. But what's interesting to me about it is that this is a case where in, with microservices architectures, we've made a decision, we've made a choice to go a certain way for developer productivity, 
But now we're coming back to, okay, how do we balance that with the ability to you know, apply policy in a centralized way, to monitor in a consistent way, and to, to actually uh, make it so that developers uh, have to, can go back to really writing just the code that pertains to the problem that they're trying to solve, right? And have the system, the platform dwelling platform take care of all these things. So on the, uh, you know, the next step over, if you will, on the architectural front, uh, you know, if you look at serverless or function as a service, and I'm not gonna get into the you know, minutia of what's you know, the naming and all that, that kind of stuff. And again, I will direct you to talks that, are, that uh, go about this in, 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 in more detail. Um, but I would like to highlight a few points. So first of all, going back to this fundamental questions discussion, right? This obviously represents the next step in uh, developer productivity, right? As a developer, I write my function, you know, I get JSON in, JSON out, attach it to, to an event, and I'm good, right? Um, and what, what's interesting is, think about microservices and containers, where I was talking about how, you know, in, in a container, right, in, in, when you're dealing with containers, now you have to worry about the operating system, you have to worry about startup time, all these kinds of things. You know, serverless kind of takes that away from you. Right, those concerns away, but nothing is free. Right, so you're giving up some measure of control. Right, so in, in order to get these benefits, the system is going to impose some constraints on how big your function can be, how much memory it can cons consume, and how long it can run. And if you don't live within those boundaries, what are your choices? Well, you can split it up into, and contrive to have one, you know, one function call, call the other. So that's all well and good. You're still not worrying about your, your, you know, your, your underlying infrastructure, but now you've introduced an extra level of complexity, right? And again, you know, this is where you can see, you know, we're, we're still kind of in early days with all of this stuff, where you can see with something like Istio plugging into this as well and kind of getting a view, uh, you know, helping you get that view. So I just want to leave you with a few parting thoughts at this point. Um, so in spite of my, my rant, uh, and my ongoing rant, you know, flavors are in fact a part of life, and you know, there's there's some goodness to them. Um, uh, you know, a key thing is when you encounter, and we're going to continue to encounter new technologies, and the and the, the pace at which we encounter these new things is going to uh, accelerate. I would encourage you to kind of pause, and step back, and say, okay, how how is any given new solution or new architectural pattern or new technology? How does it allow me to? What does it do to the trade-offs that I make? in terms of you know, productivity and all these other kinds of things. And how, do I, how am I going to solve these problems that I always have to solve, right? How am I gonna build and how am I gonna test? Um, and of course, we're gonna be living in a, you know, the world isn't, isn't simple. Uh, and so we're gonna be living in this hybrid world. Uh, and so we do have to really think through and understand the impedance mismatches. Um, and finally, you know, this is going back to the, the, the sort of history repeating itself kind of a thing, right? We, we really do want to get to, the whole goal with hybrid cloud is, is so that we have a consistent developer experience, so that as a developer I don't have to think about in different ways about different things. But related to that also, I need a consistent application experience, uh, ex application behavior, I'm sorry, right? So if, if you know, things behave differently on different platforms, I might as well have different APIs as well because I'm thinking about them differently. So that was my talk. Thank you very much.